Yes, uh, dear my colleagues, now you are uh, seeing the, my presentation plan. As you know, UBE has two uh, main uh, approaches. One is the paracentral, and the second is paravertebral approach. We are using the paramedian or paracentral approach to perform for central and bilateral recess uh, pathologies. In other words, the paramedian approach uh, has provided enough endoscopic surgery for almost all the spinal uh, canal and the foraminal entries. But paravertebral approach is performing for extra canal pathologies, such as intraforaminal pathologies and extraforaminal pathologies. So in this slide, you see in the, the indication list, uh, almost all intra and extra foraminal pathologies are indications for paravertebral UBE endoscopic surgery. Also, we have some uh, contraindications, infections which is not well controlled, and if it is carrying a risk of spreading with hydrostatic pressure, and primary tumors are certain indications for UV surgery. In additionally, if there is an excess from vertebral colon to third spaces is an, a, another contraindications uh, because of uh, fluid uh, medium endoscopic uh, surgeries. The intracanal pressure problems, glaucoma-like eye, eyes problems are relative contraindications for UV surgery. For successful surgery, a very well preparation is crucial. Surgeon should be a part of their team in preparation process. As you know, we have some essential equipments such as radiofrequency unit, endoscopy tower, and the fluid system. The patient position is another crucial crucial point by always performing the surgery in hip hemiflexed prone position. I recommend to uh, elevation of patient head at least 10 degree for prevention of uh, central nervous system and eyes from potential high pressure effect. And the patient should cover up with special drapes is important. And then after all preparation, let's see the radiological landmarks. Radiological landmarks is, is the most important step for successful endoscopic surgery. The surgeon should be followed in sections about portal opening for surgery. We should know, um, we should know that our target point should be isthmus. Portals places are uh, defining in AP, portal places are defining in AP and the lateral fluoroscopic control. In AP, uh, our triangle tip, so the triangle tip should be targeted mid portion of the spinous process. So in AP, uh, in lateral, in lateral, the triangle tip should be targeted to the isthmus. In this slide, you see the radiological uh, the, 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 the views. You see in AP, the radiological uh, uh, um, placement, the firstly, we should target it to the isthmus. Now, this is the pedicle, superior vertebral pedicle and inferior vertebral pedicle and the lateral border. We should, we should uh, open the portals about one centimeter lateral from the medilateral wall. And in, in this slide, you see the diameters 
uh, the portals and between the portals. Let's see the surgical sequences. Triangulation, working space creating, facetial osteotomies, laminal lateral edge osteotomy, and then uh, soft tissue opening and disc management. We will see all these sequences in a in a uh, 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 case. This case was 45 years of male. He had a severe um, left leg pain, walking difficulty, and he couldn't benefit from the physical therapy. And you see the clinically, he had a very severe pain. Now you see the surgery. After Triangulation, you will see like this came on your screen. Now we are creating the, the, the working space with the radio frequency probe. And then here you see the uh, facet joint, facet joint capsule and tip. Now with the, with the high, high speed burr or arthroscopic shaver, we doing a little bit uh, facet joint osteotomy. We should see the uh, joint line. I will show you. Here is the isthmus. Here is the isthmus. Just this point is isthmus. You see the facet joint, the, the synovium. This is the synovium. The hypertrophic synovium can be seen like this. Then joint line here. This is the joint line. And shaving, now we shaved the superior articular process tip. Then we are shaving the laminar edge, lateral edge. Here is the isthmus. In this step, you can see the severe bleeding because of dorsal branch of the vertebral artery. Then I'm using the osteotones to make a deep osteotomy to the tip of SAP. I'm using the zero degree endoscope for the uh, paravertebral approaches. We are targeted to open the disc level now. Disc level should be open firstly to make a secure surgery. He is now removing the bony part uh, fragments. Yes. Now the tip of SAP completely shortened by using a curved osteotome. Now you see in the joint line. Now here is the flavum exposed, lateral edge of flavum exposed. Now, the foramen, foraminal entry is widening with the kerosene punch and the drill. I going step by step to make a, enough uh, osteotomy to prevent the, the instability to prevent the joints from instability. 
Now, the ordinary root should be this location. Okay, now, yes, I see that when we need more uh, shortening of the, the uh, facet join superior articular process tip, you can do again. Uh, to go step by step, make, you can uh, make, uh, you can uh, preserve the stability of uh, facet join. Okay, now the disc level is almost opened. Here is the disc. This is the disc. Now this is the narrow root. This is the narrow root. Okay. Now the disc is opening. Disc is opened. Yes. Endoscopic surgery is an advanced uh, minimally invasive surgery. We should preserve the, the uh, surround tissues to reduce the fibrotic formation. So, so I, I don't want to touch the surround tissues. Just just doing, uh, solve the problem. Just solve the problem. No need to expose the, uh, the nerve root or dura. Because of this, you should uh, evaluate the radiology before the surgery properly. Okay. Now you see in the post immediate post operative MRIs. Uh, in conclusion, UBE is an endoscopic alternative for microsurgery. Paravertebral pathologies can be operated with the UBE surgery. Patient selection and portal definition are crucial for success. Uh, facet joint and joint capsule should be preserved for maintaining the stability. UBE can provide clear and detailed visualization for the surgery. Thank you for your uh, attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hayati. I think you'll be the host for this, the rest of the talks. Okay. So let's welcome to the doctor. Wu Pang Han from Teng Feng General Hospital, Singapore. Dr. Wu Pang Han is the member of Royal College of Surgeon, Surgeon Ireland, Singapore Orthopedic Association, Singapore uh, Spine Society, permanent member of Asia Pacific Spine Society, member of AO Spine. His topic is comparison of unilateral and biportal fusion technique. Welcome, Dr. Punk. Yeah, um, today our topic is current status of endoscopic fusion, uniportal and biportal endoscopic spine fusion surgeries. Welcome to ISUB Singapore. Um, 
Ng Ting Fong Hospital loca located on the west part of Singapore, serving about 12% of Singapore's population. Uh, in, in 2020, I do about 60% of my cases as endoscopic spine surgery. In 2021, it has increased to 70 or 80% of my surgeries. Most of my surgeries are either uniportal or biportal surgery, and uh, the application is to all the single one to three level of degenerative spinal conditions, including fusion and uh, cervical surgeries. I thank my mentors as well as I declare my conflict of interest here. Indication of fusion is important. The success of surgery is built upon your correct indication of surgery. In summary, for both the Blumenthal and Simon's paper, which uh, we are quite familiar with, to fuse or not fuse a degenerative spondylolisthesis depends on whether there is significant uh, this height of more than 6 mm and lack of restabilization signs such as osteophyte sclerosis. Vacuum design is another sign that maybe there is some reason for the fusion to uh, surgery to be happening. Facet orientation, if, uh, well, there is more for uh, open surgeries, but if it's more than 50%, i.e. more surgically oriented, and there's a facet effusion is a consideration. And if there's significant translation and angulation of spine in the flexion extension film. Personally, I do a clinical assessment if the back pain is more than leg pain. And when the pain happens, when there's a change in position, and with or without claudication is one of the signs and symptoms that suggest that we should fuse the patient. One of the other uh, indication is uh, resection of more than 50% of facet joints in a laminectomy or, refused or revision surgery. I think overall spinal fusion is not recommended if they only have axial back pain other pain management uh, strategies should be deployed in this kind of situation. Fusion is an uh, effective treatment of back pain, but it's the last definitive option. As we mentioned, we should try conservative treatment, some type of uh, sometimes restorative uh, approach, such as stem cell therapy, though I, th I think it is not clear in the evidence of those treatment. Sometimes we can do a reconstruction if it's just a slip disc or other condition, we can try to do less invasive approach. And with bipotal surgery, as well as other endoscopic surgery, we can decompress the patient and may not cause significant instability to need to fuse the patient. And finally, if uh, the patient has significant instability, we can consider fusion. I've mentioned this in my um, article uh, here, published in the... Um, General, International Journal of Molecular Science of this ladder of uh, interfusion. Generally, there are three parts of fusion. One is the fusion bed preparation, which is a significant advantage in endoscopic surgery in my mind. We can uh, we, we will use biologics such as autograph, allograph, or uh, what type of cage that we use. Some mentioned there's the difference between peak or titanium. And of course, uh, other biologics such as BMP and DBM. For stability, we look at also uh, subsequent pedicle screw or cortical bone trajectory screws to uh, fix the posterior elements. Or we can use a lateral plate and uh, in anterior, uh, anterior fusion surgery, anterior plate as well. So the main difference in uh, biportal endoscopic fusion or uniportal endoscopic fusion is the uh, bone bed preparation. The fusion bed preparation is optimal when you can visualize the end plate well. And uh, that is further supplemented by uh, having uh, screw fixation at the back, which uh, is a concept of load sharing. So in this, in this current climate when uh, coronavirus is quite rampant and we are talking about a new strain, a frequent strain as well currently, it seems that there is no end to this coronavirus pandemic. We have to be prepared and uh, contribute our part as a spine surgeon. And one of the ways to do this is to consider performing minimally invasive surgery because this group of patients will 
have a less length of hospital stay, stay and also uh, may consume less resources in the hospital. So it's not only a good thing to do, but probably something we should do. And uh, we discussed that in uh, one of the articles as published here by me and Prof. Du Song Kim. What are the types of endoscopic fusion? In general, uh, for endoscopic fusion, we divide into uniportal and biportal. In uniportal, we have uh, Cambin's triangle way of fusion, which is uh, preserving facet or we perform a foraminoplasty. There's no, no interlaminar decompression, so it's hinging on an indirect decompression to perform fusion. If you need the interlaminar decompression, you may need an additional uh, incision or surge and uh, another part of the procedure. Um, we can perform endoscopic posterior lateral transforminal lumbar in the body fusion, which is pretty similar to bipotal uh, UBE lumbar in the body fusion, where the whole facet is resected and play, a cage is placed. In oblique lateral lumbar in the body fusion, it's mainly an endoscopy assisted procedure. It is still an OLIF procedure. However, additional discectomy can be performed by introducing an endoscope. In bipotal fusion, there's uh, two types uh, that is uh, well described in the literature. One is the ULIF, which is uh, similar to the posterior lateral approach in uniportal. And then recently there is a XT lift, which is UB extreme lateral lumbar in, uh, in the body fusion, which intend to put in a larger intervertebral uh, or interbody cage. This is a schematic diagram, which is published in, my paper, in one of my, our papers on the path of fusion. So as we mentioned, these are the roots. And uh, in majority of bipotal fusion strategy, we use these roots, which is in the posterior lateral route, rather than the transcambian route that is uh, employed in uniportal fusion surgery. These are some signs to look for to decide where is the appropriate uh, level of fusion as well as whether we should go from the front or the back Generally, if there is significant bony, uh, bony stenosis, I think a posterior, posterior lateral approach can be considered. And uh, we can, if the psoas or is it not in the favor or the significant adhesion or abdominal surgery or aorta uh, or the vena cava is too close to the uh, OC window, the oblique uh, corridor window, then uh, I think lateral assess surgery is uh, not appropriate and hence we go posterior. And when we go posterior, I think uh, endoscopic fusion has a role to play. In terms of um, um, you doing a uniportal K leaf, which uh, employ a uh, facet preserving transcambine approach, sometimes you can see a two nerve roots, which is uh, uh, at the foramen duplicate nerve roots, which is a contraindication. So if you want to do K-leaf, you have to be very careful in looking at these things. The tools for fusion. In terms of uh, endoscopic fusion, uniportal, you have a two various type of uh, instruments and tools and various angle. So that makes a significant learning curve in each of the strategies of fusion. Well, biportal has the advantage of using very similar reproducible approach in performing fusion. And it has ability to uh, introduce large tools such as huge, uh, such as larger osteotomes, larger forceps, as well as uh, larger curettes in order to perform fusion. I find that it's especially advantageous in uh, harvesting of autograph as a lot of uh, the autograph can be obtained in larger quantity because of the use of osteotome and uh, kerosen, larger kerosen ranger. Uh, we, I publish, we, we publish about um, the difference between uniportal and uh, biportal holding and uh, as well as uh, uh, various techniques um, and how to overcome this learning curve. I think in many, uh, in both, type of uh, fusion surgery, we have a good standing posture in uniportal, essentially it's one uh, in skin incision and two hand operating technique, while in uh, biportal is two incision, 
uh, with one holding the scope and the other holding the equipment. Bear in mind that uh, by port, I mean, we are going to put pedicle screw anyway, so uh, we need two incisions. So saving incision in a uniportal uh, maybe have a lesser role in terms of uh, in skin incision preservation. In shoulder preservation, uh, in shoulder position wise, uniportal, you need to abduct your shoulder more than five portal. Those are subtle differences. And uh, in terms of uh, surgical assistant in uniportal, you don't really have an assistant because there's only one incision. Most of your assistants can't do much to help you, while in biportal, you can turn to retract the nerve roots. And you can make more portals, such as the junks portal on the contralateral side, although not applicable, not so applicable in fusion sometimes. Or, uh, third portal to put in a large XT leaf cage. These are possible in biportal surgery. So technical pearl, uh, uh, this is going to be accepted by International Journal of Spine Surgery. It's going to be out soon in our publication. Mainly in uh, uh, K-Leaf, we uh, do serial dilation and this preparation in the transcambian triangle and uh, gradual uh, using a special cage glider and uh, q rats we can perform the fusion. In our technique, we usually use the drill to perform the discectomy and subsequently use some specialized curette to prepare the end plate under endoscopic uh, vision. Well, in terms of unilateral, uh, uniportal posterolateral approach in T leaf, what we do is to use the stenosis scope and dock at the isthmus area. I, we tend to drill across the isthmus and harvest the uh, inferior articular process using the tube system, uh, you, the working retractor tube in the uniportal retractor. This is how it's dock. This is the case that I performed uh, last year. And then we drew across the isthmus and harvest the facet and subsequently retract the traversing nerve roots and place in the cage. This is the final results uh, of the instrument. The, it's one year out. Sorry, it didn't have the post-op x-ray. He is doing very well. It's, uh, and uh, there's no screw loosening and he has fused in terms of spinal fusion. This is how it's done in the schematic diagram. And in biportal fusion, we do similar strategies. Instead of having a uniportal tube to protect the traversing nerve root, we can have a specialized retractor as well as an assistant holding the nerve roots. That may free up our hand to put in the cage. Um, we tend to put in a large uh, bullet shaped cage that is used in uh, microscopic tubular fusion uh, surgery. And then we subsequently put in the screws. So, this is the result, how it looks like. And uh, this is how we do it. So a 57 year old man uh, with a significant, significant back and leg pain, spondylolysis so L45. Um, and then you can see foraminal, extra foraminal stenosis. And we measure the pedicle size as well as the cage size. And we performed this last year in September. Uh, we docked on the isthmus, we drew. And uh, this, uh, first we exposed the spinal laminar junction, exposed the facet joint. You can see the facet joint here, the inferior articular process overlapping the superior articular process. Then we drill the isthmus across. And uh, until it's the inferior articular process is loose, it can be quite tedious. I mean, the drill isn't uh, huge. I mean, there is a, no large equipment in Uniporto despite the nosis surgery. So you tend to be need a little bit more time. And uh, however, in the recent published article, uh, Prof Kim and I, uh, we, we can do this uh, harvest uh, in less than uh, an hour for, for both uh, superior and inferior articular process resection. And then we remove the flavor to expose the underlying um, traversing nerve root and the disc. We can use the kerosene ronger and the forcep to do that. And then you can see the 
um, it's a loose decumentum flavum now. And then we uh, rotate the tube to get the discectomy performed, isolate, coagulate. And then in this part, it's pretty similar to biportal fusion. And then we prepare the end plate as like so. And uh, eventually uh, put in the cage. You can see the cage is inserted under fluoroscopic and endoscopic guidance. The nerve is uh, decompressed. And uh, this is the X-ray intraop results. So uh, we have published our series. We have used it for various type of approaches, including grade two or three. Grade two actually not recommended for three spondylolisthesis. And this is a bipotal approach. Um, we have written up uh, in one of the atlas of surgical techniques textbook. In terms of decompression, for me, um, in terms of fusion, I like to make a horizontal incision uh, and then uh, dock, like uh, dock on the isthmus and aim towards the isthmus. You may have an extra incision if you want to put a larger cage, uh, X T leaf performing uh, X T leaf technique, more lateral approach and a more. Uh, lateral preparation is needed. In ST leaf, uh, you've got to have complete resection of superior articular process in, in terms of the most lateral part of it. While in terms of U leaf, you can uh, preserve the last bit of the SAP so that you won't have excess excessive bleeding. So this is how it's done. In the earlier cases, I tend to put a, a, a spinal needle opposite so that I don't get disoriented. And currently, I do not need to do that anymore. Um, this case uh, is done recently uh, in the right L4-5 uh, fusion. And then uh, I find that this type of procedure in bipodal surgery is quite efficient and use osteotome and uh, harvest more bone graft. However, of course, the, in terms of results, I find that it's similar in both the unipodal posterolateral fusion as well as bipodal uh, fusion. This is how we prepare. You can see the view is different. Uh, you are, your scope is independent of your uh, working instruments. Uh, I tend to make a line with the cutting burr first so that we are sure drilling on the facet capsule to clear the capsule up a bit to loosen it up so that it's easier later uh, when we harvest the facet joint. Subsequently, um, we perform, I think I, I, I have done the osteotomy. Uh, as I forwarded it, I used the osteotome and done a, you can see a straight cut osteotomy of the inferior articular process. And then of course, uh, now we did a superior articular process uh, resection, exposing the decumentum flavum attachment, this is the midline spinal laminar junction. And then we use the curet to, uh, I, I tend to like to uh, lift up the whole flavum as one piece. I know Dr. Professor Tian Dashan just now showed that maybe a piecemeal approach, you have less bleeding. Uh, anyway, in this case, we use the uh, atro, uh, I mean, we use the radio frequency 90 degree ablator, and then um, you know, it, uh, bones have this equipment, and then uh, we to, to do the um, this preparation. And uh, we I think there's a, we use a special uh, working retracted tube and then the, to protect the nerve root. We have uh, other um, retractor that's uh, provided by either Bones or some of the other Korean company to retract the nerve root as well. And then uh, insert the cage directly. If you need, as I said, uh, if you want to do active, you have to be more lateral in terms of a cage position. You may want to put the K wire to uh, locate the position of the cage and you the distance between the exiting and traversing nerve root to be more than, uh, preferably more than 14 mm. Anyway, for this case, uh, we put in quite a large case as well. Large case as well. Which one is doing very well and has gone back to work in pharmacy. Um, this is a two level U leaf. I think I, for, it's quite repetitive. I'm not going to show these are the incisions uh, as they heal in about three months. 
So there are more and more literature on uh, both bipolar and unipolar fusion techniques, and uh, it has shown to have uh, good results. I contributed to some of the early uh, uh, papers on the unipolar uh, posterior lateral fusion, and uh, and they generally have good uh, outcome in terms of EAS and ODI as well as fusion score. In terms of fusion score, that paper is accepted by uh, Global Spine Journal, but it's not published yet. And similar results, I find similar results in my own hands um, in the Bipoto series as well. And Professor Hao Donghua uh, and his team, uh, Dr. Song um, and uh, Dr. Jin Hua Yum, who are Cho Wen Park, who are all the uh, earlier, early. Uh, Pioneers of bipolar surgery have published a result on the fusion and they have very good clinical results. And it's also seen in, uh, of course, there are other groups who are also pioneers of uh, bipolar surgeries in South Korea. Overall, um, the OLIF uh, is mainly uh, done as OLIF. And then the, if there's a prolapse in the vertebral disc, you can use, uh, you can use a small scope place in the defect of the annulus and then look for the disc. We have seen just now in Professor Tian's demonstration that sometime in, there will be a pro annular defect in, and after the old lift, there's possible disc extrusion and cause uh, pain and symptoms in patients, especially if there's a significant stenosis at the back. So using a, inter, using a small scope can help to retrieve this disc from the front. These are some of the picture in the paper. Overall, uh, I think both techniques are uh, in uniporto is good. Um, they are, have different clinical implications, but it's not it's out, kind of outside of our topic today. Um, but the bipoto has a uh, similar uh, in terms of anatomy and approach to the uniporto posterior lateral fusion. However, there is a more um, a freedom of uh, maneuverability in terms of using your working channel and larger equipment can be used. Overall, the learning curve is um, steep. I, I, I published this in our paper and I recommend uh, fusion to be one of the quaternary. That means you have done enough, uh, probably discectomy and then decompression. And then uh, subsequently, even I think cervical and fusion are about the same level uh, because um, there's a lot more equipment needed in these surgeries. And overall, I find that in uh, training myself, uh, overcoming learning curve, as well as uh, my, uh, my other peers who wants to do scope surgery, I find that in uniportal posterior lateral fusion uh, can be quite disorienting. And uh, you need a, a very much magnified view and you need to uh, be familiar, very familiar with uh, in, uh, endoscopic uni uniportal decompression to perform the surgery. In UBE fusion, uh, I think the learning curve can be uh, potentially a bit less steep. Uh, however, in, in my own uh, series, I find that both of them have good outcomes. And uh, overall, it's really the surgeon's choice uh, of which technique they use. Thank you. I will stop sharing now. Thank you very much, Dr. Wu Panhan, for your excellent presentation. And uh, if uh, any question, we will take the, the end of the all three presentations, but also you can uh, send your questions uh, to the Zoom platform or you can leave your email. We will contact you. Now let's welcome the next speaker, Dr. Ashraf Rizki Gatam from uh, Fatma Wati General Hospital, Indonesia. He is a member of Indonesian Endoscopic Association and the Asia Pacific Spine uh, Society. His topic is cervical biportal foraminotomy. Okay, can you see my yes, screen now? Yes, yes, yes. We can see. Okay. We can start. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, I can start. So, uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for uh, giving my speech here in the uh, biportal endoscopic uh, meeting here. So my topic today would be a full endoscopic uh, posterior cervical foraminotomy for foraminal disherniation and foraminal stenosis. So I'm an orthopedic uh, spine surgeon in Jakarta, Indonesia. 
So as an introduction, we know that radiculopathy caused by uh, cervical foramen pathology is very, very common in our practice. As for the moment, all the gold standard that uh, has been given is uh, ACDF. But uh, we as an endoscopic surgeon think that uh, ACDF is a bit much uh, when uh, having a foraminal pathology, even if it is a disherniation or even a foraminal stenosis. So we know that the anterior surgery could cause risk of uh, cirrhosis, adjacent segment disease, and there's also approach related complication uh, because we have to pass the esophagus, we have to pass the trachea, and we have to deal with uh, the uh, great vessels around there. And then uh, there are also anterior non-fusion for aminotomy, but I think uh, it's technically very demanding because the uh, size is very, 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 very uh, small, especially the hole that we drill on the bone is very, very small. And it's yeah quite hard to do uh, anterior uh, non-fusion for aminotomy. And for posterior surgery, uh, we know that uh, when we are dealing with the foraminal pathology, we know we can preserve the motion and we know we can preserve the stability. And it is uh, one of the minimal invasive surgery that we can do. And then we could directly evaluate and mobilize uh, the nerve root if uh, it is needed. But there are also problems with bleeding, uh, nerve injury, and also facet uh, violation, of course, when we do the posterior cervical foraminotomy. So, the evidence for uh, cervical uh, for foraminal stenosis management is uh, actually at the moment still ACDF by North American uh, Spine Society. But uh, in uh, this uh, uh, evidence, uh, they also uh, recommend for doing the uh, posterior laminal foraminotomy for a single level degenerative cervical uh, radiculopathy. So basically, it's a uh, surgeon's choice whether you can do the ACDF or you can do the posterior laminal foraminotomy for uh, cervical foraminal stenosis management. So if we also see from uh, other uh, evidence, uh, we see that uh, for the cervical foraminotomy by uh, the Swedish spine register, they were more efficient at the index level in the foraminotomy group compared with the uh, ACDF, and also. But uh, for uh, from the German, the Spessian Rutten said that, uh, well, there are some disadvantages in doing the cervical posterior foraminotomy. So we have a very limited possibility to expand the operation when there are some problems when we're dealing with uh, the operation itself. So basically, uh, we will encounter a problem when doing the foraminal uh, uh, foraminotomy. And then, but this is one of the option for uh, radiculopathy management. So the indication is of course, uh, radiculopathy and then failed conservative treatment. So this is what we have to remember that uh, lateral disherniation that can be approached by from, from the posterior. When there is a central disherniation, we have to think about PCDF or even uh, anterior uh, PECD. And for foraminal stenosis, it's, uh, which is caused by the facet degeneration or osteoligamentous hypertrophy. So this is uh, all the contraindication uh, for the uh, foraminotomy. Uh, Myeloradiculopathy, which is uh, quite relative because uh, we know that some of the surgeons are doing uh, cervical decompression using the uh, endoscopy from the posterior. And, and then, uh, the second one is, of course, when there's a deformity, loss of cervical or bruises, I prefer to do the anterior surgery, maybe carpectomy or doing the ACDF multilevel. And uh, loss of this height, also this is a relative contraindication. Uh, it depends on the problem of the patient. When the problem is only uh, foraminal pathology, then we still can do the posterior foraminotomy. And also the other control indication is central disherniation, central osteophyte, which is uh, quite impossible to access from, from the lateral side. And then cervical fractures, tumor, or PLL. And of, yes, this is uh, one of the absolute indication, I guess, for doing 
posterior laminal foraminotomy. So there are things to consider uh, prior to doing the foraminotomy. First is the clinical anatomy of the foramen and the nerve root, because if we see uh, the nerve root location uh, within the foramen, it is quite inconsistent if we compare from, for, from the lumbar spine, because uh, the location is quite mobile in the cervical, sometimes it's located near the uh, lower end of the upper pedicle, sometimes it's located near the upper, uh, upper border of the uh, lower pedicle. And the distance is uh, also variable. And then the space that is available for disectomy is also uh, uh, not consistent. Sometimes it is located on the shoulder, sometimes it's located on the axilla of the nerve root. So we have to know, we have to identify the uh, uh, space available for disectomy during the uh, surgery. And also the anterior osteophyte and medial dissemination needs special attention because sometimes we have to drill a little bit of the uh, pedicle to remove the uh, osteophyte to get a good uh, working space uh, during the procedure. So this is one of the paper that uh, shows the uh, differences between uh, the, this, uh, the space available for disectomy, the medial border until the nerve root from the C3 until C7 and uh, when when we are see when we are seeing this uh, paper, uh, we can see that uh, the distance is actually increasing uh, from from the upper level to the uh, lower level. So also the nerve root length is also much longer in in the lower uh, level compared to the upper level. So this is one of the things that we have to consider uh, prior to doing the foraminotomy. And then uh, next is the next position. So I always try to strengthen the cervical lordosis because it increases the foraminal space and also it increases the space for uh, discectomy. So it is very important to straighten the neck. And then the next part is epidural bleeding. Uh, during my early days when doing the uh, spine endoscopy, especially when uh, trying to do the uh, cervical endoscopy at the first time, Epidural bleeding is uh, actually one of the most uh, technical problem I encounter during the surgery because sometimes uh, when we hit the epidural vessels uh, and the bleeding starts, sometimes we could, not, we could not find the source of the bleeding itself. So it's very, very hard to control. So uh, for the beginners when doing the cervical foraminotomy, we have to be careful with the epidural vessel and when we see the vessels, it needs to be meticulously controlled. And uh, the size of the epidural vein and uh, the amount of epidural, epidural vein is very, very abundant compared to the lumbar spine. So this is uh, my surgical technique and steps. So basically, uh, first is also is absolutely making the portals. So. Making, making the portal is very, very important in uh, by portal uh, surgery. So usually in cervical spine, we can use uh, one uh, working portal and one viewing portal, portal for two levels uh, for aminotomy or even laminectomy. So what we need to find is first uh, find the V point. So this is the V point. And then this is the endoscopic image of the V point. So uh, basically, this is this is the V point. Yeah, this is the uh, IAP. This is the ACP. This is the facet joint after I open the uh, capsule facets. So this is the V point. So sometimes when when we didn't do the uh, straightening of the uh, neck, we could not see clearly the uh, ligamentum flavum before we drill out the. Uh, lamina and also the medial facet. So, and then the next part is also IAP medial resection. So basically this is what, what I did. So uh, removing the medial uh, IAP and then after that uh, removing the uh, part of the SAP until we can see the ligament of flavum. So this is uh, at the lower part here, this is the uh, natural detacher from for the 
uh, ligament and fibrum. So, and then after that also, after that, of course, the doing the flavectomy and then do the root mobilization and discectomy. So this is one of the uh, case. Uh, this is a male 40 years old with left arm pain with normal neurology. We can see that there is a lateral disherniation onto the foraminal part. So what I what I did was uh, doing cervical foraminotomy. First is uh, evaluating the V point, drilling the uh, part of the IAP here, and then uh, drilling out uh, part of the ACP, and then uh, removing the uh, uh, ligament of Latham, removing part of the ACP until we can uh, see the uh, nerve root. Yeah, sometimes over the nerve root, there is a part of the uh, facet capsule joints we when, when, and we have to open it. So this is the uh, epidural vein. It is sometimes very, very problematic when we didn't uh, control it uh, very good. And then removing the uh, ligament of labrum. So, so this is this is uh, the uh, number of the vessel is quite a lot. So if you can see here, the space available for disectomy is uh, very very small. So we have to drill out a little bit of the superior part of the pedicle uh, to get the space towards uh, the intervertebral disc. So. And then by pushing using the uh, dissector, and then we can remove the disherniation. And the uh, disherniation in the cervical spine is actually uh, quite small if we compare to the lumbar spine. So this is the uh, image after the uh, operation. Uh, I'm sorry. Yep. Okay. And then the next uh, the next uh, part is uh, the, the next patient is a female, 47 years old with. Left arm, left arm pain, which with they have a foraminal uh, stenosis here on the left side. What we do is also uh, cervical foraminotomy without discectomy. But uh, when when we, we are doing with the uh, in 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 this patient, we are doing two levels of uh, uh, foraminotomy using uh, one one working portal and one viewing portal. So we can see here it's two facet joints. Uh, over uh, one viewing portal. And then the uh, laminal foraminotomy as, uh, is actually quite the same with the uh, previous, uh, previous uh, patients. You can see here, removing the part of the uh, ligament of labrum. You can see here uh, already the uh, nerve root. And then, so yeah, as you can see, so uh, we can we can go directly to the uh, upper level uh, without the need of doing uh, without doing the need of uh, making uh, another portal for this patient. So in the end, after after we open up uh, the foramen, we can. We can see both of the uh, foramen after the uh, surgery using uh, one view. So this is one of the uh, advantages of doing uh, a cervical endoscopy. So this is the result. So we can see here uh, two uh, holes on uh, the foramen. So uh, so far I've been doing uh, around 70 patients of uh, cervical foraminotomy and all of them are very, very good. The result is quite quite all right. And the FAS of the arm pains decreasing uh, after the operation and almost no neck pain. So the after the operation, the FAS may be around one or two at, uh, at most. Yeah, most of them don't have, uh, don't, uh, don't complain uh, any neck pain after the operation. So I had two patients uh, who had incomplete decompression. Uh, actually, this is at, uh, during my early days of doing the endoscopic foraminotomy. You can see here, I only do the uh, laminotomy, uh, lateral part laminotomy, but I think I need to do more of the uh, facetectomy. Uh, 
So another complication is uh, I have I had three patients uh, with uh, numbness after the surgery. So other than that, I have no uh, problem with uh, doing uh, full endoscopic foraminotomy. So in conclusion, the evolution of haptics and instruments enable us to perform uh, posterior procedures safely. And evaluation of the nerve root is, is better in endoscopic posterior approach compared with uh, anterior surgery. And this is one of the option for uh, foraminal stenosis management with low complication rate. And I think uh, foraminotomy is one of the option for uh, cervical radiculopathy with good uh, intervertebrate state. Thank you. Back to you, Dr. Hayati. Thank you very much, Dr. Gautam, for your wonderful presentation. And I want to remember again, if you have any question, you can send your questions to uh, Zoom platform and we will discuss uh, about your uh, questions after the last, uh, last presentation. Uh, I want to welcome to next speaker, Dr. Gazwan Hassan. He is orthopedic spine surgeon from uh, Al Kindi Teaching Hospital, Iraq. Dr. Hassan is the orthopedic surgeon of uh, Cabos uh, 2016, the chairperson of uh, Aospine Iraq Council. His topic is UBE, how to start to become a profession, applying deliberate proactive concept. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Hello, dear. Okay. Okay. Okay, right now. I think yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah, my talk will be recorded or uh, if the okay. internet is stable because I'm in the car. Ah, so yes, okay. Yeah. Okay. The voice can is start. okay. Please share your, okay, thank you. The person of Aerospine Era. Okay. I want to thank you all to invite me to be a part of this a wonderful group. And I will give a talk about how to start and become a profession and reaching the maestro in the UBE. Nothing to disclose on my talk and my learning objective. I will I will start with introduction, review the learning theory, and then I will proceed with my approach. How I use this approach to apply in my surgical training and my experience. The surgical training program are evolving from traditional time-based schedule to competence based one, which define the learning outcome and surgical knowledge, clinical and technical skills according to the training level. And this has a short a potential to shorten the training time for some to become a competent surgeon. In the seventh century in Europe, they start to use one technique which is called pedagogy in which it's applied to the children and here the teacher has total control the learner are dependent and the learner experience of little value as a learning resources and they are motivated by external motivator and this theory are applied even to the surgery as seen in these pictures where the let's say the, the, where the teacher teach the uh, fellows and other doctors in the same uh, way. While the other theory, which is called andragogy, which is focused on the learner and the adult are self-director, feeling of dependency, and there's a gap of need and the ability to self-director. Here, the learner have more uh, freedom and uh, than uh, the previous theory. The principle of andragogy include the need to learn, the, learner, the learner's self-concepts, the value of the learner's experience, the readiness to learn, and the orientation to learning, and finally the motivation to learn. And when we compare the pedagogy to androg andragogy, the pedagogy model are more appropriate for your subject, the, de uh, the dependent learner, and the medical students and general residents, while the other model 
are more appropriate to be grounded in subject, self-directed learner, and senior residents and, uh, and fellow. Here are some of the, let's say, common and the difference between each technique. So when I review the theory, how, how, how to become a mastery, and uh, one, one thing that's come in my mind about 10,000 rules, 10 hours, 10,000 hours rules, which is actually, let's say, uh, referred by Bill Gates, who, who, who has used it uh, uh, in his uh, career. And if we divide these 10,000 by seven hours per day, or th in three days a week, so I have to have 10 years to reach this mastery. But can I apply it? Personally, now I'm in my 40s, so it's not logic for me, at least, to become a mastery and being like that to reach this technique. Another important concept about the peak which is how to master almost any, anything. And uh, Andres Erickson, in his book, that's he, he, he highlights the concept of mental presentations is the key, which is called deliberate practice. And the core component of this practice, that we have to have a specific goal, intense focus, immediate feedback, and go out of the comfort zone. So the theory of the learning are four mainly, which is the cognitivism, connectivism, behaviorism, and constructivism. And here, the feature of each one that are present in the slide. One important topic about the applying these theories in the learning, which is what's called instructional design, which is the science of instruction and to provide a systematic and evidence-based methodology for the creation of instruct, instructional material for effective teaching. The ED approach, which is the analysis, design, development, implementation, implantation, evaluation, and this is used to apply in the learning and the multimedia uh, principles share the best practice of designing the multimedia teaching materials such as video animation and multimedia presentation. And the theory is that we, we can learn by it, that we can divide it into motor skills acquisition, which is depend on the cognitive, associative, and end up with autonomous. While the other is called social learner, which we start with attention, retention, reproduction, and then motivation. While deliberate practice, as I, as I mentioned before, they have five principles of its which is started by push beyond the comfort zone, work toward the well-defined specific goal, focus, and receive and respond to high quality feedback. So we have to have a mentor and develop a mental model for, of expertise. Other learning theory is what's called motor simulations. As we hear, we, we, we start it's defined as the ability to imagine the performing a movement without executing it. While the visual motor imaginary, which is versus the kinesthetic motor imaginary. So as a conclusion for the surgical training, they are, have the common that include observation of the skills demonstrated by the expert, internal Internal, uh, internalization of the water imaginary, mental practice and repetition, and then physical deliberative practice. So these are 12 points that I applied in my knowledge and I started to do it in my career, let's say eight years ago. Whenever I start to, uh, let's say, to learn a new technique, which includes, for, of course, the UBE, we have to have a clear why and set a goal, reference, mentoring, overcome the st struggles that are present in my environment, easy start, backup surgery plan B, feedback loop, ask the expert, measure my progression and then my how to master it. So I will go for each steps. And then we have to, to have, let's say a clear why. As Simon Sinek in his book, start with why, that he started 
that we have to have a clear why to do and then how to do and we will end up with what. So if we reflected this to, to the, let's say, new technique as a UBE, I have to have why I need this technique, the purpose of this technique, the motivation and the self-progression. So second point, I have to have a clear goal, which, which, which I mentioned that uh, I can measure it by a clear, smart goal. It should be specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. And then I have to dig in the reference to check the knowledge of this technique and simply by digging in the article, book, video, courses. Then mentoring by simply by fellowships, learning the tech, uh, how, how can I learn the technique? How can I get the tip and tricks from the mentor? How can I start this technique, feedback, and then expert opinion? And I apply this, this point in many steps in my uh, uh, approach. And these are some pictures of, from the mentors that I attend them and I get lots of from them. And another important point, how can I overcome the struggles, which is actually lots in my environment. As we don't have assurance support, we don't have advanced centers I can start. We don't have some instruments that need for this technique and also the backup surgeon and the others. So another important point, we have to have, let's say, easy start. So it's not logic to start with more difficult cases or start to do, let's say, fusion, and I didn't start my technique in a simple disk. So the first important point in this, uh, let's say, step, that I have to start with a simple disk, avoid the complication or complicated disk, avoid the stenosis, revision, deformity, and diffusion during my start. So here are two examples of the cases. So in the left side, which is a disk in the four five, which could be a candidate for to start with, while on the other side there is a complex uh, spine stenosis with the instability. So I have to shift to the left side cases while, uh, and choose it to start in comparison with the right side cases. Uh, one of the important points that I have to, when I I want to start, I have to have backup surgery, which is let's say an expert surgeon that can be available during my initial surgery. And this, I apply this with my mentor, uh, uh, Avan uh, uh, Kavi, who is an expert in the scopic spine surgeon from India. I invite him to Iraq and I start to do 